Now, despite a predicted run of 9.6 million Fraser sockeye salmon, catch allotments for commercial fishers remain relatively low. And that's left a lot of people in the industry flummoxed, including the Native Fishing Association, which represents Indigenous commercial fishers. We talked to them yesterday. Earlier this week, we heard from Michael Griswold, uh, who resigned from the Pacific Salmon Commission in protest of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Management. So today, to help us parse through the science that mixes with DFO management goals, we have a leading provincial salmon ecologist, Professor Scott Hinch. He is the head of the Pacific Salmon Ecology and Conservation Laboratory at UBC. A very good morning to you. Morning, Gloria. Nice to be back. Yeah, well, thank you. What a time, too. We've had uh, so many stories about the salmon run this year. So 9.6 million fish. That sounds pretty high for, for a Fraser sockeye return. I mean, can you put it into perspective for us? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to unpack. And um I think it all starts with everybody's expectation of what we thought was going to happen, uh, which I think was around 3 million. Um, and, and to understand why we kind of first got to this higher number, you have to understand that, you know, these are model predictions uh, that are quite complex and based on a, a lot of information on the number of spawners, the number of babies that were produced, the uh, environment that those babies ent- encountered when they got into the ocean, their temperatures, the competitors, the food. And then we come up with probabilities about what the likelihood is we're going to come up with any particular run size. And for 2025, the most likely outcome was 3 million, but models also predicted the 10% chance of 13 million and a 10% chance of 4 million. And we ended up on the higher end, but still it was within what um, our models were suggesting. So. You know, these, these are just models. Um, since ni- 1999, uh, sorry, 1998, the, the actual returns have, have only been close to their predictions in about 10 years of those 28 years. Actual returns have been under those predictions by in about 12 years, and we've over-predicted in about six years. And 2025 is one of those years. And it was going to be a decent run. We knew that given a lot of the uh, information that we had from ocean conditions. It's just it was a lot better than, than we expected. And um, so that kind of throws the management systems into a bit of a quandary when this starts to happen because you have to start changing um, rapidly how these quotas and allocations are going to be made. And, um, but you can only allocate and give quotas uh, once that we've decided how many fish are needed to go to spawning grounds, what we call conservation. And then what's left after that then is allocated to First Nation fishing and ceremonial purposes. Then what's left after that goes to the commercial uh, sector, and then after that to the recreational sector. And these allocations can change a lot um, if it looks like the migration conditions in the river are getting difficult uh, and they're going to be killing fish, or uh, if there's um, the possibility that when we go to harvest, what we see are really strong components of the run, there's some populations that are involved that are endangered. And this is called a mixed stock fishery that we have. It's really difficult to to manage because you want to go out and access these abundant fish, but at the same time, there's fish migrating through there that are endangered and they don't look any different and they're the same species, but they're different populations. And so that creates one of the, the, the basic challenge that fisheries management has with Fraser Sockeye to start with. Right. You know, I, I mentioned that we spoke with Michael Griswold. He resigned from the Pacific Salmon Commission, uh, as well as a conversation with the Native Fishing Association. And again, they had this frustration over the, the limited commercial license quotas and, and what they feel is a lack of transparency overall from, from the DFO about those decisions. Um, I appreciate the way you just walked us through it, but I'd like you to just listen to what Fiona Claxton had to say. She's the executive director of the Native Fishing Association. Well, at first it was, you know, the water temperature. Well, when that didn't, then they went to the water levels. Then they went to bycatch on Chinook. Then they went to all sorts of other reasons. And here now they're talking about the commingling of the late run. We've got a couple of early re- late run uh, sockeye in the mix. So let's not, you know, uh, uh, damage or threaten them. But, you know, I think everybody's, kind of asking themselves when somebody's saying no and they're they're changing their reasoning as to why they're saying no so many times, almost as if they're pulling reasons out of the air, 
the cynicism starts to kick in and you start to think, what's going on here? Again, that was uh, Native Fishing Association Executive Director Fiona Claxton. Uh, Scott, what goes through your mind when you hear those comments? I completely understand. <laughs> um, I always say managing fisheries is much more mad difficult than rocket science. And the, as I said, the challenges uh, for making these allocation and whether we're opening fisheries at all decisions um, what is weighted by all of the things that she just said. And indeed, pre-season, we are aware of, of the possibility that river temperatures could be high, and we know they will be. They, climate change has made the Fraser River two degrees on average warmer now than it was uh, uh, 40 years ago. And we know, the science tells us, how many fish are going to die when they get into the river at those temperatures. And that's a lot of the work that I've been doing over the last 30 years. And so we, we have a pretty good understanding. Unfortunately, I think what happens is the way the message comes out um, is probably seen as uh, uh, without a lot of explanation. And the explanations why she was noting seem to be changing. All of these uh, parameters are part of the management decisions way back early when they're making, when they're deciding on pre-season uh, allocations. We all know these are possibilities that can happen. And in fact, if we look back uh, when we had larger fisheries, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we saw the same issues then. This really, this isn't anything new. It's just that DFO now is a lot more risk averse than they were 10 years ago. Um, and, you know, this is a result of the Cohen Commission inquiry telling us that we have to be careful. We have to protect weak stocks, the ones that are, are small in abundance. And we have to be aware that climate change is real and we're going to see maybe 50%, 30%, 40% of these fish dying in the river before they get to spawning grounds. So, you know, the commercial fishery um, has certainly suffered a lot in the last few years or haven't been many large fisheries. However, the challenge is getting fish to spawning grounds. And of course, commercial fisheries access them first long before they're heading to their spawning grounds well in the interior for these large populations. And so that's the challenge that managers are faced with, getting the fish to the spawning grounds in a, in a number that is appropriate for conservation while understanding that your fish are gonna die along the way. So you can't harvest as many as you might think because we're gonna lose a third or a half of them in the river. And at the same time as that's happening, you have endangered stocks, endangered stocks at migrating through. And yes, you can go out and access those abundant ones, but there's a possibility you can remove all of the endangered stock with just a few uh, with a few harvest openings. And, and that's what they're trying to be risk averse against, because in the past they weren't as as this. So, you know, uh, it's a difficult decisions that they have to make. And I and I, my heart goes out to those that want to access more fish, but we certainly have to ensure that those are getting to the spawning grounds. Um, in adequate numbers. But I do want to say that, you know, when we step back, this is a really good year uh, for an endangered stock. And the first run that comes up the river each year, the early Stewart uh, one, is an endangered sockeye run. Um, we were only expecting about 100,000 of those fish. We, we think over 700,000 came back. Now, that's a remarkable good news story for a population that was blocked by the big bar landslide in 2020. Very few spawners made it through. Um, and so the in 2021, those have been the spawners that created the offspring that are coming back now. And it shows how effective the restoration was in the river with all uh, parts of government coming together, provincial, federal, and indigenous, um, and the hatchery interventions that they brought to bear at that moment. So again, this is, uh, on one hand, a really good news story. Um, from a conservation perspective, it just becomes a difficult one to manage uh, because of the complexities when we're talking about the fishery end of things. Okay. No, no, you, you, you've explained it well. I appreciate that. No, uh, I'd like to wrap this, this up, but I, I do want to get in the, you know, something else that's been circulating. A lot of people wondering about the, the impact of closing some, some salmon farms in the, in the Discovery Island region a couple of years ago. That was 2022. Could, could that... Um, influence the, the, the runs that we're seeing today? So that particular factor isn't worked into management predictions. Um, the, the, we're, we're focusing a lot on ocean conditions and temperatures in the ocean and competitors and food availability, but the risk from aquaculture isn't factored in. Um, it is a risk. There's no doubt about that. Um, but it, 
the the fact that we had such a large return this year uh, with some of the salmon farms being out of the water um, is a positive sign, but we can go back and see 2018, 2014, 2010, 2006, 2002, 1998, all these years had far higher um, returns than predictions, and yet we had salmon farms in the water then. So it's it's not a simple uh, uh, explanation saying they're out of the water, therefore we're seeing higher runs. There's no doubt that they're a risk and they could, it could be contributing to better, but it's far too early to say that now. So we'll have to look over the next couple of years to see if this pattern continues. Scott Hinch, really a pleasure to hear from you this morning. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Anytime. That's Scott Hinch, the head of the Pacific Salmon Ecology and Conservation Laboratory at UBC.